Portions of this show sponsored by Hudson Honda. Seven twenty nine. Since the president's decision last week, this is the Piscopo in the Morning Show. I'm Frank Moreno. Uh, since the president's decision last week to uh, withdraw troops from Syria, he is being criticized by uh, a lot of generally traditional allies, including uh, Lindsey Graham, including Marco Rubio. And he's being praised by some who generally are very critical of him, uh, including uh, Chris Matthews and uh, some others on the left, including uh, some former members of uh, Barack Obama's foreign policy team. But rather than gi- have you m- me give you my opinion about what's happening in Syria and where we're going in Afghanistan and uh, kind of the way forward in the aftermath of General Mattis's departure. I thought, why don't we actually get someone who knows what they're talking about? And over the last couple of years, there have been very few military analysts, military experts that I've enjoyed talking to more than Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. Uh, Colonel Davis is uh, a 21-year, retired, 21-year veteran of the United States Army. He's been deployed into combat zones four times, including in Operation Desert Storm, including in Iraq, and then cl- including in Afghanistan twice. He's been awarded the Bronze Star Medal for Valor. He's been awarded the uh, Bronze Star Medal for his uh, service in Afghanistan. And he's somebody that uh, I find whenever I read his commentary as a fellow with defense priorities and wherever I see him on television or have had the privilege of talking with him on radio, He's someone that always makes a great deal of sense. So uh, let me say hello and good morning and Merry Christmas to Colonel Daniel Davis. Colonel, thanks so much for coming on the radio with me this morning. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. Thanks for having me. And Merry Christmas and New Year to you, too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So let's let's talk Syria. Um, what is your analysis of the president's decision to withdraw from Syria? Absolutely the right uh, answer, and actually it's been a long time in coming. When he first made those comments at that rally in Ohio in March of this year, uh, I was a strong advocate then that, that he needed to follow through with action and applauded it. And, uh, you know, it looks like a number of people possibly, or actually reportedly, General Mattis is one of them, or Secretary Mattis, uh, pushed back on that. And uh, I think President Trump finally just decided, you know what, if I'm going to be the president, I've got to stay true to my instincts. And and I'm going to go ahead and take action on this. And so now he's given that order, and and I think it's a good one. Now, obviously, I don't have your expertise or experience, um, but I completely agree with you that it was the is the right thing to do with respect to withdrawing troops from Syria. The one aspect of the criticism of the president that I do find maybe has some merit is how the president announced this. He went on Twitter and basically said, we're withdrawing all the troops from Syria. Could he have handled this better? Should he have, for instance, briefed his own advisors, told them, this is what I'm going to be doing, and then maybe called some of our allies around the world and maybe even called some of the key uh, foreign policy and military affairs folks on Capitol Hill? Could he have done this better stylistically? Well, I, I think maybe if, if the president would would uh, talk to you before he makes future decisions and does everything that you just said, then he would be in much better shape. Wow. Uh, by all means, those those are absolutely every single thing you just mentioned is is what should have happened. That would have made it a lot better. Uh, but you know, this is the president we have. This is you know the good side and the bad side, and, and his policies are right. Just the way he does it is is. Uh, you know, a little unconventional and, and certainly could be better. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much the, the, the bottom line. That's what should have happened. It's just not the way uh, he operates, unfortunately. All right. So now one of the key reasons that the president said he's withdrawing from Syria, which, again, is a decision I wholeheartedly support, was that ISIS is defeated. Now, you're seeing a lot of folks, including some of the president's uh, traditional allies, both in politics and in the media, you say, wait a minute, Mr. President, ISIS isn't really defeated. As you, uh, your understanding of the situation, um, is ISIS in fact defeated? Well, this is, this is uh, on the downside, this is one of the really bad jobs the White House has done in communicating because they, they put out uh, detailed information less than 12 hours after the decision was made where they clarified 
that when the president says that ISIS is defeated, he's not saying that the 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 intel or the mentality or the certainly the terror organization of ISIS has been defeated. But they specified that he was talking about their physical territory and terrain had been taken away from their caliphate. That part had been defeated, and certainly that's the case. But then they em- emphasized that the the battle against ISIS on a counter terror front continues on without without a change. And so they they haven't done beyond that first comment. They haven't done anything in the press to say every time that question comes up, they should be saying, "Okay, we're not talking about that. We're talking about this. This fight will continue. You're correct. It's still a threat, and we're still working on it." That's what they should have said. That's what they're saying they're doing. They just should do a much better job communicating that. All right, let me read you some of the other criticisms of the president's decision here. Uh, Lindsey Graham, who um, you know, is now talking about actually holding congressional hearings over the president's decision, which is mind boggling to me. He never had a problem with uh, sending troops into harm's way and wanting to hold hearings. Then it's when we're bringing troops home. That's when he wants to hold hearings. But uh, Lindsey Graham said Russia, Iran, Assad, they're ecstatic. Um, Senator Ben Sass, a Republican of uh, Nebraska, he's calling this withdrawal a retreat and charge that Trump's generals, quote, believe the high-fiving winners today are Iran, ISIS, and Hezbollah. Um, Let's talk about the Iranian aspect of this. A lot of people very concerned that by pulling troops out of Syria, uh, that this allows Iran to gain an even stronger foothold in the Middle East. Is that true? Well, number one, I wholeheartedly, enthusiastically endorse the idea of, of hearings Let's get these things out on the table so people can actually understand what's going on as long as somebody who knows what they're talking about is on the uh, witness list. But the fact of the matter is that all of those people you just mentioned, leading with Senator Graham, unfortunately, is a dramatic misapprehension and a lack of understanding of what those troops have been doing on the ground. And they actually – the implications are that they're doing some – really important thing right now that, oh my gosh, if we pull these guys out, it's going to cause this vacuum that all these bad things are going to happen. Nothing could be further from the truth. Those guys, there's actually only a handful, like just a few hundred actually kinetic uh, warriors, so to speak. The rest are like maybe trainers or administration, or they're securing their own cells. When you have that few people, and I've been in these combat situations before in isolated places in both Afghanistan and Iraq, and I can tell you for a fact that most of your uh, energy and most of your resources is on protecting yourself because just think, we're in a hostile territory where there's enemies all around everywhere you are. So you have to defend yourself. So you're not actually performing anything of any strategic value at all. And that's one thing I've been reinforcing to anyone who will listen is that, you know, like Lindsey Graham and and, uh, and Rubio especially, they're acting like these guys are performing some really critical function, but they're not. <clears throat> As what they are doing is they're absorbing enormous strategic risk for our country because you have the possibility of a, of a an, an accidental or unintentional clash with Russian mm, forces, right. which could escalate into who knows what, and and everything that we're there could cause problems and harm for our country, but we aren't doing anything for our national interest over there. And, you know, uh, the the very likely possibility that we were heading towards an armed conflict with our NATO ally, Turkey. Apparently, one of the things that precipitated this was President Erdogan spoke with President Trump and said, hey, by the way, we don't care if American troops are protecting the Kurds. We consider uh, the uh, YPG, we consider them terrorists, and we're going to go after them whether they're Americans are there or not. The president, in my view, did the wise decision and say, yeah, what, what do I want to risk an armed conflict with a NATO ally for the Kurds for? But uh, a lot of people are saying, look— By doing this, we're abandoning the Kurds. The Kurds have been our allies. The Kurds need and deserve our support. How do you respond to that criticism? Are we leaving the Kurds out in the lurch on this one? Yeah, and I'll tell you, uh, this is the consequence of bad policy going all the way back to the Obama administration. There is some truth to that, and let me tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Number one, President Obama sent us in there with completely bypassing the Constitution, when you're sending U.S. armed forces into a sovereign other country, regardless of what you may think of them, that's going to require an international uh, agreement 
or like from the UN, if nothing else, to give it legitimacy. But even more so than that, for our perspective, that violates the U.S. Constitution. You can't send them in there on your own decision. And even the reasons initially were, were completely crazy because basically we were supporting all kinds of groups that were unvetted, many of which turned out to be counter to the United States and pro-Al-Qaeda. Then finally, though, they said, OK, well, let's let's change that and let's just go after a rocket because us and the, the Kurds from the Syrian Democratic Forces, we both have common cause to get rid of ISIS out of the, their so-called capital of Raqqa. So let's focus on doing that. And actually, actually, Trump increased the troops for that very purpose. Well, that was accomplished in October 2017. Now, by all rights, we should then have redeployed the troops because while we had common cause with the, the Kurds, then we should have worked together with them to eliminate uh, ISIS from that area and then redeployed. There was never any expectations and certainly should, was no representation that we were going to become the permanent defense force for the Syrian Democratic Force. So there was the expectation all along we would leave. But now this uh, – I've actually spoken with some friends uh, who have uh, contacts directly in the SDF in Syria, and they've told me that this – to your comment earlier in the show – this completely caught them by surprise and felt like a gut punch to them because they felt like that they're just being suddenly abandoned. So I strongly advocate that the president does not just turn this over to Erdogan and say, do whatever you want to do. I hope he puts a lot of diplomatic pressure on him not to do that because we did uh, work with them and they did enormous jobs, the Syrians, democratic forces, you know, in, in helping us get rid of ISIS out of Raqqa. So we should not just abandon them because I think that would be wrong. So, uh, Colonel, uh, I have loads more questions for you. And in fact, I just launched this podcast where I'm doing long form interviews for an hour. I'd love for you to be a guest on my podcast sometime and we could really delve into some of these issues uh, in, in depth. But uh, my final question that I want to ask you today, because we're way late this morning uh, any, anyway, is um, there while there are the 2000 troops from Syria that are in Syria are coming home, we still have 17,000 troops in Afghanistan, an area that you knew very well. Uh, not only were you decorated for your uh, bravery there, but you not only did you serve two combat tours of duty there, but you wrote a report saying that essentially everything that uh, uh, that the, the American public was being told about what was happening in Afghanistan was either inaccurate or a complete deception. Should we withdraw these 17,000 troops from Afghanistan as well? Absolutely. Without hesitation, yes. And the reason is for the same reasons that I identified in 2012, which was the same thing I identified earlier in 2009, is that you cannot win a political struggle and a diplomatic struggle with military forces. And we have proven as strongly as you can. At the time I wrote that, there were estimated 20,000 Taliban. After the surge, after the 140,000 NATO troops, now according to Senate testimony by General McKenzie earlier this month, there are approximately 60,000 Taliban. Now, if you couldn't get 20,000 to come to the negotiating table with 140,000 NATO troops, by what possible rationale does anyone think that we're going to get it with 15? It's just not going to happen. So this war will go on forever unless the president takes action to end it. Colonel, I hope we can talk again soon. I always get a lot out of our conversations. Thank you very much. Always my pleasure. Thanks. All right. If you